building roads when we go back to the kingdom. Most people are not going to find this really enlightening, but to me, it's been one of the things that I've really wanted to do since coming to faith, when I go back to the kingdom, to start building roads. And I stress constantly about getting people to Jerusalem on the days that we're required to go. And of course, the fact that we're required to go on that day does not mean that's the only days we go. We want to be with the kingdom around the Messiah at all times. So it's a constant thing. We're wanting to go there whenever we have a chance. And so I was researching some things today and I found something that was pretty interesting because it's not in most of our translations. Did you know that's actually a Torah command? And it's really interesting here. So in Deuteronomy 19 verse 3, is when you're going back to the land, you should prepare for yourself roads. And our translations now, most about half of them, eliminate that from that first part of Deuteronomy 19.3, that we're actually supposed to build roads. Now, to me, it's a big issue because I am in the tribe of Asher, which is in Lebanon, and there's no roads connecting Lebanon to Israel. So the only way to actually get to Jerusalem is to go the back way through Syria and down through Jordan and then coming back into Jerusalem. But we want to have the quick, easy way. Again, if you are in uh, Manasseh, you are the very bottom portion of Lebanon and you can't get to, you have to drive up and around. It's, it's, you'll spend 10 times the amount of time on the road and that's without traffic jams. And you know we're going to have traffic jams because you can't get two and a half million people to Jerusalem in one day with the roads that we have that's not prepared and not made for that amount of traffic. And because he says we should be building roads, I think it goes a lot further than that. I think we prepare our roads not just for ourselves, but for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. You know, when we go back to the land, our population is not going to be that great. But at the end of the thousand-year reign, our population is going to be incredibly large. We need to kind of prepare for things for that point. And I think we have the ability when we go back to the land, we will be at probably the wealthiest we will probably ever be. It's probably best to put things down then to start the work to, um, to allow us, not just us, but our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and those beyond that to get to Jerusalem repeatedly. Um, and so one of the great things I look at is, and again, this is me, I've looked at the different methods of travel. We have vehicles, and I have thought of a different way of doing vehicle travel there. Um, now again, we've got to put the road connection um, between Lebanon and Israel. That shouldn't take that much time. We should probably be in that for, you know, no more than a month or so. And that road should be, you know, we should be able to build that. But you can't get all the people that we have going north to the king kingdom for the feast days, for the re required times. And again, we want to be going more often than that. You know, we're not that far away. You know, if we're, uh, let's assume you're around Beirut, you're about 200 and some odd miles. Well, you can be there in four hours by vehicle, as long as there's not bad traffic jams. You could be there and, and great. You know, why wouldn't you be? You know, I mean, the Messiah is there. So one of the methods I've thought about is actually taking tra uh, tractor trailers and taking the, the, the trailer portion and converting it to a bus. And that way you're always having, you don't have to worry about the, the truck part, the part with the engine and the transmission. The, the cab part, it doesn't matter if it's 50 years old. As long as it's able to roll, it rolls and it'll get you to the kingdom. And so as the engine wears out and the transmission wears out on the truck, you replace the truck and the cab itself is fine. So you, know, you put really nice seats in there, put some windows in there, and get to the kingdom very easily. Now remember, we're not going to the kingdom bare, you know, empty-handed, so we should be bringing some animals to sacrifice as long as other things. So those things should be going with us. We should not be dealing with the money changers in the temple. 
we should be sending those out there. So you have the, tr the trucks as well, tractor trailers, that are sending over our animals and they should get there first. Put them in a pen, wait for us to get there, we'll find our animal in the pen and we're okay. Um, that way we're also not doing money changing, which is great. We don't want to be doing that. We don't want to be trying to make a profit at the temple. Bring the animals like we're supposed to do. And, um, you know, again, those trailers, they're not that expensive to, to actually convert. I mean, we're talking about less than a few thousand dollars to, and I say a few thousand. Um, but it's not that expensive. And again, once you do it, those things last. And the bed of a tractor trailer, the, the actual um, trailer portion, usually is oak. So it's a beautiful, you know, you can actually make it to a nice floor. And so, you know, you could actually do these things like the old 1920s uh, passenger trains that are just solid wood all the way around there. Something you would want to travel in just to be a luxury thing. Have these great reclining chairs in there so you could just enjoy the trip. You know, because you'd be taking a lot of people, you know. When you go, you're not just going by yourself. It's not like we're going to get into a little Honda Civic and get everybody there. Because you're taking your whole family, which will you also include the Levites. And you're, you're also bringing in your servants and your manservants, your female servants. So everybody who's with you is going. And I think large families. So, you know, even if a tractor trailer and you're hauling, as my math would show, about 31 people per tractor trailer. And that's to do it in massive comfort. You know, you're not even going to get all your family in one of those. So the other method that I've really thought about. Now, again, some people would say, well, you go by plane. There's no way you're going to get that many people in the plane because you can't get that many people landing at the airport. It just, it can't handle that amount of traffic. But what it does say is we need to actually build another airport in Amman where it's closer to Jerusalem because we can't be in the princess portion when we do this a big international airport in Amman to allow people to actually go back and forth so they can actually come in. Now the other major airports uh, that we would have would be Tel Aviv and in lower Beirut which would be should be the land of Neftali or the tribe of Neftali. Um, but I would think we're going to have these three big airports to get everybody into Jerusalem um, that are coming from outside of the tribal land. You know if they're coming from Turkey, Russia, Great Britain, um, so anywhere in South Africa, you know, China. This is where they're going to come. So, I, because of that, I think the airplanes are already pretty well packed, so I don't think that works. There is a train that goes from Tel Aviv, which should be the airport, to Jerusalem. Currently, that's going to be loaded, you would pretty much figure, with plane passengers, so that's not really helping out people. And so I think the real, the best method to do this is to bring in high-speed trains. And maglev trains are probably the best method. And you can actually get them into what we would consider like a hyperloop, or um, which is just something by, done by Elon Musk. But it's not well thought out how he's got it because he's trying to keep these things above the ground where the air heats them up and cools them down and they shrink and, and um, you can't have shrinkage when you're doing a 300 mile long tube. It's got to be at a consistent temperature. And the only way you're going to have a consistent temperature is to be 32 feet below the soil. If you're 32 feet below the soil, it's the, the soil at that point in time is stable with the temperature, so the tube is not shrinking and, uh, and expanding. Um, now there are going to be some expansion because of the heat, because the maglev vehicle is going to produce some heat, but it's not having to produce that much, and so it would be a consistent heat throughout the tube. Um, and again, but even with that, it would need to, you know, as long as it's being a constant, it shouldn't be that big of a problem. Um, but we still have to have some viability for this type of situation. And again, you do that by having multiple, um, probably every hundred feet or so you have another air pump to suction out. And that way, in case there's anything that's created, again, you're 32 feet below the ground. You're not allowing air pressure to come in if something there does in fact crack or expand a little bit. Um, so it's, it's safer as well while you're down there. And why I say that, if you've ever studied Hyperloop, 
the biggest worry they have is air coming into it because if a train is going at 700 miles an hour or 900 miles an hour and then it comes into atmospheric pressure, it would slow it down to about 200 miles an hour. So it's basically like hitting a brick wall just by air and it would kill everybody in the train. So we can't have that. That's why I say it's better to keep it underground. Um, when we go back to the kingdom, we're going to be very lucky that the people that produce this kind of stuff should be the ones who are having to pay us tribute because of attacking Israel. China certainly, I believe, is one of the countries will be attacking Israel, and they're going to be responsible. They've got the funds available just in their gold reserves to take care of the trains, to build the trains for us. Um, Russia would, should also be one of the countries that's attacking us, and they have the ability to provide power and more power to the, to the tribes, and not just to the tribes, but also throughout the world. Now, is that that big of a deal at that point in time? No, because we're going to be burning the uh, weapons for fuel for the first seven years. But after the first seven, you know, thing, time's up. So, and again, we don't want to do any of this power stuff. I wouldn't think we'd want to have it in the kingdom. Um, we can provide that out in Syria or in Jordan and bring the electricity into um, tribal land but not just into tribal land, and we should actually be a net exporter of energy and so that we can help those who are around us, help those who are in Turkey, help those who are um, up in Georgia, as a region, um, but to help those other countries with their energy requirements, providing uh, Egypt as well, um, Libya, you know, going down to Sudan. And these should be countries we should be helping, you know, our neighbors and providing insight on how to do these things even better. Um, from the math that I'm doing, if we were to have the tubes and what I'll call a hyperloop installed, and we had a number of them, um, enough so that we could bring in a 13 million people to Jerusalem in a 12 hour shift. Now again, we'd have to be expanding upon that for those who are coming behind us, our grandchildren and things like that, but that would easily take care of everything so that we could all get to the kingdom very easily and that future generations could get to Jerusalem very easily. We do it when we start off this thing, and again, we've got a Torah command on it, Deuteronomy 19.3. <laughs> and that way, those who want to go by road, they go by road. Those who want to go by train, they go by train. It's going to be very difficult to go by plane. But those who go by train, to put it in perspective, if you've got one of those systems that it's built and it's free to us, because it was done by basically what I'll call war reparations, the only cost of having that is using it. Well, the usage on a hyperloop aspect would be about 18 cents and that's for a round trip ticket. Even though you wouldn't be able to do a round trip ticket because you would only go one way because you'd stay there for a while, the train actually has to do a round trip because it has to go back to pick up the next set. set. So it's about nine cents one way, but yet you're buying actually a full ticket for the train to get back. So it's about 18 cents. Well, add a few more cents to it for electricity, at your train stations and things, the lights, and you're looking at a quarter per person to get to the kingdom. Now who's going to argue with that? And you could be in the kingdom in 22, 24 minutes. Um, and those are for the longest areas. You know, Gad is coming the farthest. They could actually be in the kingdom in 24 minutes. And for a quarter per person. Now if that's the case, who isn't going to be traveling to the kingdom and traveling quite often to the kingdom? I mean, we travel that more than that now on a Sabbath to go to congregation, most of us do. And we spend more than a quarter in gas to get us there. Imagine that we can go and actually see the Messiah on a Sabbath, or why wait for a Sabbath? Imagine you can go see him on a Tuesday, or Wednesday, or Thursday. It takes a quarter. You can be there in 24 minutes. So 25 minutes, I could be around the Messiah. You know, if you finish work early, hey, let's, it's only a couple minutes, let's go down, let's see the Messiah. And, you know, we can be back for dinner if we want to. But why would we want to be here when the Messiah is there? So 
again, it's it's a requirement from Torah. So again, that's why I look at these things. Uh, I looked at them before I realized it was a requirement from Torah because I just stressed about how are we going to get everybody there. I, I've done, um, I've actually done time schedules of when we should leave if we're doing it by road and how many people we could get, how many you know by buses and by the tractor trailer that I've described to get everybody there. Um, yeah, without keeping the road too congested, it's it's just a crazy thing that I do. But um, I'm actually glad that I see a Torah command since I've been putting so much effort into this type of thing.